This room is packed, and also we are seeing some colleagues here. Like, it is a testimony of how relevant this topic is and how exciting it is to have you here. But because this is a complex topic and a complex person, I need to read because otherwise I'm going to lose my plot. Also, it's end of the term. So, it is my pleasure to present one of my one of my most interesting and inspirational uh, colleagues, Stephanie Sherman. Of an so, that thank you for being here. Okay. She's a mover and shaker. Uh, she has been reshaping this course in the most, most interesting courses in special practices. So thank you for doing uh, that. She's a sort of contemporary polymath. And um, why I'm saying this because in her bio, she is like, she's a designer, strategist, writer, and producer working around and across urbanism, technology, and culture. She did a lot of projects and organizations that reprogram outmoded systems. I'm super interested on, on, <laughs> on this. I want you to teach me about this. <laughs> <laughs> At least you're doing so that, that and you'll think about this. There is a very she has co-founded uh, non-profit organizations. She has uh, collaborated with tech companies, city governments, research no groups, and foundations. Living and processes, and then eventually that process has been terminated literally by deactivating the, the biological. She's also an associate director of this, which is a very problematic part for and me as a designer. Era. That's, that's good. Okay. <laughs> which has an intriguing <laughs> name, and she also the they they do the also intriguing things, and they such as reorienting planetary computation. And philosophical and technological and geopolitical things, and yet Amazing. within the process, we And today the she's going to talk about the relation between the people might say, Oh, yeah, whatever, it's a micro maintenance, it's a very planet, responsible for the and life. one of the hard and it's a, subjects, which is AI. AI. So, the thank you, Stephanie, for enlightening us today. Brain. Thank you. There's a few thank yous to make before I get started. Thank you, Adriana, for inviting me. This is such a great opportunity to kind of 
share some thoughts and think new thoughts. I, I said to Adriana earlier that I always want somebody to title my talk for me because that is like an exciting opening to think about things you've never gotten to think about before. Um, and thanks to uh, Alex and, the, and all of Spatial Practices for such a great term and really my team at Narrative Environments for for the collaboration, Beth, Chavi, and Satraka, really for making this term happen. But before I start, I really just wanna give a huge round of applause to Oscar for leading BA in such a spectacular way this term and being like an inspiration to us all for this term. So thank you, Oscar. Um, we will, we will miss you in this role, but we will hopefully find you in many others um, to be invented. So yeah, so I'm just gonna dive in and talk about this. Um, it's great to see so many um, friends. Some of you I mostly see in Teams chats. Others of you I mostly see at parties. Um, so it's great to have you all actually um, in person here to chat and, and to kind of think through some of these things that I've been thinking about for quite some time. And um, for those of you in narrative environments, you're gonna hear stuff that you've already heard, but hopefully in a new way, or maybe it lands in a new way. Um, so I'm gonna talk about these things. Um, first, I'm gonna just talk about a little bit about my work and the different initiatives I'm involved in that Oscar mentioned, just to, for some context setting for how do I think about these things and where do they come from and where do these big ideas come from. Then I'm gonna talk about planetarity, mostly vis-a-vis -vis the Earth. Um, what we think we mean by AI, artificial intelligence, and then maybe the implications for maintenance. Um, so first off with the narrative environments, we start um, here really with, um, this was a Guardian, Guardian post that showed up the first day of the course this term. And it showed up at the same moment that there was an article further down that they had postponed the climate goals for emissions till 2050. So, um, the provocation of the talk about maintenance is also dealing with a question of crisis, I think, and how these things map onto one another. And so um, by narrative environments, we really do mean this in, our, in the most expanded sense, like how are we dealing with the environmental crisis that we have, the environments around us, and what, what are the implications for narrative in all of its guises around that? So very simply, this is our kind of fundamental course diagram. We think about how story systems and strategies intersect. And we do this really at the scale of science, technologies, and society. So we have the opportunity to work across a lot of different domains. And perspectively, we're always navigating between these two poles, the kind of overview, the map, the big picture, and immersion. What is it, it, what is it to be inside something? Um, and toggling between these, never one or the other. Um, we're a design course, and we really think about design not as ornament or decoration, but as these things, as designating, patterning, planning, plotting, platforming, predicting, naming, contriving, and intervening. And that might be a different position on design than some of the other courses, but also maybe the ways that we typically talk about design. It really is the art of planning and of making artificial in some ways, and we'll talk about that further. So also in the course, we try to move beyond these binaries that often structure our typical thinking. Um, we, we do more topias than utopias or dystopias, thinking about why interiors or exteriors have been separated, um, nothing is purely good or bad, or actually that these ideas of the natural and the artificial are actually as artificial as they are natural. Um, nothing is exclusively an intention or an accident, and so on and so forth. Um, and with, we're really lucky to sit within the spatial practices program because we get to think about spatial practices in its expanded and futuristic sense um, in all of these different ways and that like actually in some ways almost everything as we'll see is becoming a spatial practice and especially computation. Um, and in the course we really try to think about philosophy as the fundament and then practice, what is your practice and profession because um, we, we really like to think that you can make, make an intervention in the world at scale. Um, so the course, of course, has some of its roots in a long lineage of speculative architecture, um, of futures thinking that was in collaboration with companies and partners 
Bucky Fuller's World Game, um, Eam, Charles Eames, but also has its roots in kind of early demonstrations of what virtual reality is, so to speak. Um, and then really excited about the other kinds of environments that we might intervene in and tell different kinds of stories, um, interiors, operating spaces, and so on. Um, we also, of course, are navigating the question of what we're doing here, as I started with. So this is the Earthrise image. You might be familiar with it um, from the Apollo, Apollo mission in 1968. And this overview effect of kind of displacing the human. So at this moment in narrative environments, we're really trying to think through what it means to have decentered uh, the human and what is our relationship in the world. Of course, the Copernican revolution did something similar in that it realized that the Earth was not in the center of everything. And we think that we're undergoing a similar kind of transformation. Um, we're also quite interested in, but critical of images like this. I'm super excited to get my Apple headset so I can move around. Um, but I also hope that in the future, the apartments that we live in don't look at all like the background we have here. And so we're quite, we think a lot about how the kind of images that we have of the future are really not the images that we should have of the future. However, there's also these great opportunities to think about what the implications for space and architecture might be when you can render one-to-one -one kinds of models or simulations or maps of the space. And of course, um, thinking like a machine or what it is to look at things like a machine is as interesting to us as seeing from the perspective of the human. And all of these transformations, as, as I'll get into in a bit moment, really force us to ask, well, what, what is the human anyway? And it's probably not what we thought it was going into this from at the first place. So through the course, we identified as part of our um, reapproval process seven research themes that are aggregating and building up under any project we do. They look like this. Um, so they're everything from narrative machines, a whole history of how these, you know, this is like 800 languages be boop, but the level of communication that's happening with them is pretty intense to um, chat GPT, which may or may not be making our stories more or less interesting. Um, Environment-based modeling, where we're kind of pivoting away from agents as the subject to what, how are agents actually shaped by the environments in which they inhabit. Um, this is, a, I don't know if any of you saw the news, but DeepMind just announced that they are now able to predict uh, climate and weather changes much earlier than we've ever been able. So this is an example of AI really changing the time horizon of, of how we're able to plan and maneuver. Uh, pervasive automation, so what is the kind of tipping point at which automation is embedded in all of the landscapes around us um, from big farming to restaurants. Um, so this is happening all sorts of ways. Hybrid intelligences, so thinking about intelligence not only as a function of human, but um, was COVID an intelligent virus, for example, in its way that it was able to maneuver and evolve and, um, and manipulate? Um, and what does it mean for kind of all, all these different kinds of intelligences to be coming together? Social infrastructure, so this is for uh, lots of us are interested in community uh, space, reprogramming the kinds of places that we have in society. I like to remark that the restaurant emerged after the French Revolution when all the cooks fled the uh, castles. And so given the changes on the horizon, we should probably reinvent the kinds of public and social spaces that we have available to us. Operating theaters from um, you know centers for surgery where if you've ever heard the audio going on in one of these environments, the actually discourse in an operating theater is totally incredible. They also, some surgeons play really crazy music on top of having very specific protocols around this, um, to operating theaters that may not have humans at all and what, what kind of is that even narrative in any device, but also operating theaters like this that's more of a mission control and remote sensing kind. And finally, last but very not least, universal basic luxury, which thinks about what is kind of luxury for all, not only in this kind of architectural sense of transforming an apartment building into an apartment building with winter gardens for everyone rather than knocking it down in a social housing context, but uh, that we actually, in our 
non-helmeted breathing water available space, we are already experiencing universal basic luxury, which is actually at stake. Um, we're also just really excited to shout out to all the first year students who have just completed really incredible story systems projects, which is our first year project. Um, and we're kind of, we're really excited about all the collaborations and all the experiments we got to do this term. And so more on that coming soon on our various media. Um, so I'm also really delighted to be part of a think tank called Antikythera, or Antikythera as we say it usually, but it's properly Antikythera as uh, Daphne, one of our first year students, has corrected us. Um, and I'm here with my collaborator, Nikolai Boyajev, is in the audience as well. He also joins us on the course for lots of things. Um, but we are a think tank reorienting planetary computation as a philosophical, technological, and geopolitical force, which is an incredibly heavy and lofty mission, but actually somebody's got to do it. Um, because we're, we feel like we are at an impasse and technology right now is being used for the wrong thing. So where does this name come from, as Oscar was asking? It comes from this device, which was discovered off the, I, um, the coast of the island of the Greek island of Antikythera in the early 1900s, but it's dated to about 200 BC, and it's understood to be the first computer. And what it was, it was really not only, you know, it, we, the, the reason this device is so inspiring for us and, and the idea of a mechanism as a piece of technology is inspiring for us is because it really served as not only a device for calculation, um, but also orientation, navigation. So it wasn't just about kind of probability that it was actually thinking about what is our trajectory in the world. And I think the same kind of provocations, as we'll talk about later, are opened up by new kind of emerging technologies. So in this work, we're really asking the question about, you know, at some points, philosophy is way ahead of technology. But at this moment in history, technology is way ahead of philosophy. So it's kind of like, Let's not use Kant and Hegel to think about AI. Let's actually use AI to rethink what philosophy is, how it should work, and what it should be. And so the idea of, of this program is really developing a philosophy of technology to catch up to the present. And we do that through speculative design projects. There's increasing overlap between what we're doing on the course and the mission of the think tank, and that's a really exciting um, interlacing of all sorts of things with collaborators from all over the world. Now, just a little bit more of thinking about this program, because it also shapes some of the stuff I'll talk about in a bit, is the project of planetary computation really thinks about that, like, we are now on a planet that has developed and grown uh, what, what Benjamin Bratton, the director of the program, calls an accidental megastructure. So over the evolution of the planet, we kind of developed servers and satellites and this kind of whole assemblage, including ourselves and all of the buildings and all of the stuff we've created on the planet, that is a, a crust upon the earth. And in doing so, we created a conundrum in which, uh, you know, we got ourselves into this situation where that has now, is now, we're evolving with it and it's evolving with us. It's neither one or the other. So a lot of this work can be found in this book called The Stack, uh, which Benjamin Bratton wrote in 2016. And we also use this in the course a lot to think about this is, you could think about this as an alternative diagram for understanding uh, planetary relationships. So, and, and a big part of this is the idea that now in terms of, we used to think about the world as organized into nations, and now actually computation is changing the way that we think about the whole planet altogether. We all know that the climate extends past the kind of nation states that um, we've typically divided us. And the planet is morphing in this image. Okay, thirdly, a lot of this work and thinking comes from um, a, what was my PhD is and, and is now a book in progress uh, called Auto. And it started with this, um, where I had, I moved to San Diego. I almost said I had to move to San Diego. <laughs> Uh, I'm so glad I don't live in San Diego anymore because you spend your life in this. And, and San Diego is known as having the most perfect climate maybe anywhere on the planet, and yet I thought it was a total hellscape. And the reason it's a hellscape is because you spend a lot of your day, like two hours a day, sitting in a hot machine, burning oil on a freeway, looking out at the most beautiful landscape in the world. And I was so struck by how the hell 
did this happen? Like it really is impossible that all of these things came together and that we, thinking that we were designing something for ourselves to help with mobility, actually covered the earth with roads. And so we thought we were designing a planet for humans, but actually we were designing the planet for machines. And um, so I said, okay, what could I do? So I thought, okay, what if I made a movie about somebody that goes back in time and kills Henry Ford? Would this have solved the problem? Um, and and uh, I never really carried out that thought experiment because it turned out that the reality of the history that I found was much weirder than any reality I could make up, which is probably the case for most of reality. Um, and what I started looking at is also <coughs> assembly lines and kind of the history of production. And what really freaked me out is sort of looking at kind of automated production now is that in an image like this, I started to see that this was almost a, a performance of, this was humans playing at being machines. All these critiques of labor and the assembly line and the reduction of the human being on the assembly line is actually what I think about now is artificial, artificial intelligence. It is the performance of something before it comes into being. Stepping into the place of where a robotic or another life form might evolve. So what else I found in this research process was that uh, the, the process that was going on in the creation of the automobile was a similar process to what is going on at the Foxconn factory in the creation of the iPhone. And so while we think that like we've moved beyond uh, this kind of production, we've actually just relocated it. And so what this brought me to is thinking about the platform and that actually the Model T was part of this lineage of platform design and automation. Um, and that this was also taking shape and the implications of this were, there was actually a, a much clearer lineage in this. Now an anecdote I just thought it was fun to share with you is that the idea of Uber, um, which you know, not Uber itself anymore, we, we might not think, but the idea of ride share, of not everyone needing to own a car, but actually totally uh, an app on a phone that might disrupt a very physical landscape through kind of an intelligent coordinating mechanism was first ideated in a science fiction, well, James Bond, but <laughs> as a piece of science fiction and that the idea comes from the movie. So coming back to narrative environments, there's a bit of a way that the, um, life is also imitating the vision of the future we have. Not always perfectly, but that's just something. And I think finally, just as part of what we'll talk about in a minute of where this, some of this thinking really comes from, is I started to realize that this question of automation is also about an unconscious. But it is an unconscious not only in the human sense of the unconscious, but that automation itself is an, un, is an unconscious embedding in infrastructure. It is something that we don't think about. And that actually, that lack of consciousness is as useful for us in thinking about it as an environmental model as it is within our own selves. Um, and you can look at lots of different ideas that um, ways that the future might be transformed by cars and this will all unfold soon. But I also got really into the, um, just the critique of the kind of Silicon Valley, oh, we'll just automate the cars. Well, the problem is we don't want or need cars at all. That the roads are should actually, it's not about automating a car, it's about redesigning the city as a result of the cars being automated. And so scaling it out and thinking about what else the roads are good or use for, useful for. Um, and, and images like this are just like, like look at all that space. That's not, that should actually be used towards all the other kinds of public purposes that could be happening on the street, et cetera. Finally, one thing to note about that is we did a little speculative project using the stack to think about how we might intervene in this space. And one of the ideas we had was um, thinking about how we might regulate automated vehicles, automated trucks with the idea of supporting labor and climate purposes. And we came up with the idea of what about a driver's license for AI. So what if we gave, what if we said, okay, humans have driver's license and that was a really important way of regulating uh, human drivers in, in the beginning of driving because they were all over the road and there was no signs and there was no parking spaces, it was just total chaos and they gave driver's license to people. Well, if you start doing that with AI, then it actually is a tracking and surveillance system of robots, which seems like a pretty good idea of machines that are moving around. And that actually could be used to test all sorts of things, uh, 
climate, location, safety, and security, et cetera. Okay. Finally, the conclusion is here, what we call automation is also a relative process of inscribing decision into environments. So it's, you know, what we describe as automation relates to what isn't already automated already. Um, it's, it, as, as automation evolves, then we think new things are automated or autonomous or not. Okay, so at first I'm going to talk about the planet and what we, what we mean when we talk about that. So, uh, my friend Nikolai has a really great way of breaking this down. Why all of a sudden are we talking about the planet when we could be talking about the world or the globe? Very simply, the world is, or worlds, or world building, if you're familiar with that term, is the thing that you have in your mind and the kind of worlds that we build in game environments or whatever. It's a phenomenological experience. The world to you, the world we inhabit. It's the perception of this. There's the globe or globalization, which is kind of like the arrangement of the planet into nation states that then get, that organize things like citizenship, geopolitics, coordination. They also kind of, they limit us and, and define us and um, enable us in some ways. And then there's the planet, which is the kind of material substrate of which this spaceship that we're floating on is composed. Um, or grounded to, whichever you want to say. And as, as this picture shows, and as you know well, it's like heating up at a scary rate. Um, and so now what's happening here, of course, is that like that planet through technologies is also being reconstructed. We have models of this planet and that the models are, are that we have a twin of the planet in some way. We have models of the planet that are acting back onto the planet that are helping us make decisions about what we do on that planet all the time. Um, and it's I think it's important to remember that like the, the organization of the planet in our mind is an abstract and arbitrary model. Longitude and latitude is not a function of the planet itself, but it evolved us and then we evolved a system to orchestrate that so that we can, if, if I say to anyone here or anyone in the world really, longitude, latitude, this, we all know what we're talking about. So this is kind of an amazing feat of coordination, coordination that surpasses the kind of global phenomenon that we have. Um, and, and it's important to think that the planetary has these layers. It's not just like the dirt or the atmosphere or whatever, but it's, it's both the abstract sphere and also the very technological uh, development that the planet has given rise to. Um, there's about 8,000 satellites that we're using, right, that are up there right now, uh, circulating the Earth that are allowing us to do, it, do this sensing and modeling and locating. They produce exciting images like this that help us zoom in and see things. Um, and one of our heroes on the course is of course Bucky Fuller, who really thought about the planet as a spaceship. That, and remind us, we, we, we also remind ourselves in the course that we're in space right now. You know, like we are, in, it's not like space is out there, we're in space, yo. And that's just um, really important and exciting. But also that, as Bucky said, like we're, we're out of sync. We are not using the resources in the planet in any of the right ways. And so what we really need is a kind of operating manual. What, sh what are we doing here? What should we do be doing here? What are the protocols and principles that should underlie what we're up to? Um, and so that shapes a lot, of our, a lot of our thinking. Okay, now AI. Okay. It's great to just look up these etymologies and these definitions because they reveal all sorts of things. So in some ways, really rudimentary ideas about intelligence, uh, the ability to update models based on learning. That's like, you, like if you think about your own intelligence, it's like you're in a new situation, but you, ha you have lots of models that you've built up since you were a very baby about what the world is. And then when you enter a new situation, if that situation doesn't correspond to the model you had in your head, intelligence is your ability to think through how that abstract model enters the new situation. You might say the new situation is ex an exception, or you update your model. You say, actually, like, this gives me new information about this situation. It also helps you navigate that situation in new ways with that abstract model. 
Intelligence is also information about the enemy. Um, many of you will recognize that friend, the best way to create friends is to have a common enemy. Um, and that might also be what we need here, um, some sort of common enemy. I think we do have that. It might be a form of ourselves, but we are kind of uh, dealing with an enemy of the climate operating outside of capacity. And so that in some ways might be a way to bring us together in some strange ways. Um, and, and, the and intelligence is also the application of knowledge to the manipulation of environment. So you're really able to operate amongst and within the environment because you're bringing a set of capacities, but you know how to maneuver. And sometimes for us at least, that's instinctive. Um, for us also at Antikythera and like in the course, I think we're also of course making this distinction between artifice, um, that there's no such thing that's like purely natural anymore or purely artificial, that this is all combinated. Like, you know, your, your carrot has been evolved and, and hybridized. The Dutch did this really well. Like carrots weren't orange. I think Rachel was reminding me when we were in Amsterdam the other week that like carrots were purple and then the Dutch engineered carrots to become orange. So all of this, all of our, everything is recreated in some ways and evolved. Um, but there's a difference between artificial as like a copy of something natural and not real and synthetic or material or, or chemically created. So one of the things we talk about at Antikythera is that intelligence is artificial intelligence would be better described as synthetic intelligence because what happens with the artificial is that it makes us think that it should imitate us. And the, the idea that artificial intelligence should imitate or be part of human imitation is one of the biggest problems that we're encountering in the whole narrative and discourse because it's actually distracting us from the things that we should and might be doing with it. Okay, so coming back to this, now this legacy makes sense because the word computer actually comes from women in the 1950s who were, who were mathematicians developing calculations and doing the calculations at, uh, sorry, that's much later, in the 1930s, um, yes, 1930s, yeah, um, who, were, who were doing these calculations to program things at, at um, Betchley Park and during these experiments. And so part of what we're thinking about is the Turing test as the wrong starting point. The idea that a, hu that a computer or AI or an intelligence would be able to imitate humans, to imitate a gender of humans, is like totally not where we wanna start by thinking about AI. Because actually there's great things that humans can do that AI can't do. I think we probably all know that. Caring, touching, um, loving. Let's hope, like that's not what AI needs to do. But also recognizing that we're really bad as humans at a lot of things. We're really, really bad at we're bad at long-term planning. We don't have much. We don't have scope for like wide thinking beyond our own perspective. We can bring that together, but we obviously can't detect patterns at scale. We can't do massive calculations at scale. We can't track all of these things. So this is not the right starting point. The other thing that we draw from is thinking about one of our um, fellow researchers and friends, Sarah Walker talks about intelligence as a planetary scale process. And that AI, it's not like AI is this thing and then there's life. It's actually that AI is an evolution of life. That this is all part of a longer history of evolution. Um, and that by equating consciousness or awareness with intelligence, we're really making, making some mistakes. Because if we think about intelligence as actually something that the planet can be, that the planet through this sensing apparatus can kind of be a form of intelligence that has evolved through the things that the planet evolved us and then we evolved this technology and then that technology will probably evolve something else. And so that this is part of an evolutionary process, it's not a separate one. Sarah and I had a, a coffee and we were also joking that you know, why the narratives around these things trip us up. What if we were to just think about artificial intelligence and call it the automated internet? 
Like, because in a way, it really is a way of taking all of the discourse and everything that we've uploaded and sort of running processes and doing models on this. And would we be so freaked out by this if we just called it an automated internet? So it's just that the words that we're bringing to this do matter um, in, in terms of that. The other thing to say is that there's kind of this long history of uh, AI as separating what we might think about as the biosphere and the technosphere, these kind of uh, different domains that we, we might have early, early, earlier imagined to be so separate. But that's to say that they are increasingly integrated. And um, one of the early cybernetic thinker, thinkers, von Neumann, thought about what happens if just like plants reproduce themselves, you also have technology that starts to reproduce itself. Um, so these narratives, I just, we pulled some of these things. I, this is like a new pet project, is just like headlines of uh, the freak out that's happening around this. And it's really hard to get into a conversation, especially in the UK, but also kind of almost anywhere, about whether you think that AI is going to kill us, which, sure, it's every, anything is possible, um, or that AI should really imitate our human values. And this kind of freaks me out because from what I can tell, I'm not so sure our human values are so good. <laughs> I, like last I checked, at least like every bit I've looked in history, we're not, at least we might, some of us might have the values, but we're definitely not good at acting on them. And we haven't figured out the right mechanisms for coordinating them. So like, I get really confused by this uh, situation. And it's also in terms of the narratives about replacement, uh, that the AI is going to kind of scary new AI is human, it's going to kill us, it's going to take our jobs. These are, these are things I'm, I'm um, skeptical of because I think if, if we're better than that, um, anyway, we'll get to that in a minute. So just to say that I really like this math teacher's protest against calculator. Like this was really like the calculators are after us. It's the algorithm's fault. Um, it's, it's this kind of situation that we, like we really need to put this into perspective here about like that we must be better than being this worried about the AI replacing us. That, that would be a hope, anyway. The panopticon, oh, interesting. Okay, so we, <laughs> so just, just I, wrote a, I wrote a piece on this um, that was really thinking about, this is a very familiar image if you're in architecture, maybe not in stage one yet, but you'll get to Jeremy Bentham soon enough. And, and the idea of the panopticon, and we're very worried all the time about surveillance and witnessing, um, and this model, this kind of architectural model where there's this big kind of, uh, there's a big guard in the center who looks out over all the prisoners and keeps watching everything. And Foucault talked about how you internalize this guard, that like the, the guard watches you even when the guard is not there. And if you actually read some of Jeremy Bentham's utilitarianism, he's very into like fiction and, and fantasy. So like, you know, the guard kind of does all these staging things up in the tower to like leave the light on or prop the ladder in such a way that you never know when the guard's coming back. For, so for those of you interested in the theater of this, it's very exciting. Um, but I wrote a piece called The Polyopticon, which suggests that there's something more concerning at stake, which is that it's not about who guards the guards, but what if everything watching everything makes us less relevant? And that's the biggest concern. Like our, our crisis around this is that like, what if everything is watching everything else and we're irrelevant to what is being watched? Like that, that might be more the psychosis going on here. And this is like opens up another idea, which is sort of that like we do operate in a sort of distributed or swarm intelligence model that like not all intelligence is coordinated or controlled in this kind of command way, but that there's many forms of intelligence that are based on kind of more local systems that are then evolving and, and shaping in different ways. So coming back to this, just for a second, this, this primal scene of this um, wrong turn, so to speak, just to remind everyone that when you're uploading your picture, you're contributing to, this, to the apparatus, which you might call surveillance. 
Um, then there's all sorts of repercussions that might be happening around this, around uh, masking. I was really excited during the pandemic. I thought like everybody would mask forever in different ways and I was really hoping that we would just go full mask and it would be normalized and it's not and it's get the mask back. If you're sick, please wear a mask. It's great. Um, so there were there missed many missed opportunities during the pandemic, but this was a big one for me. Um, coming back to the human values thing, that this is like the, I don't know, we have an image of society that we are thinking that AI should imitate, but this is probably not the image of, that we really want AI to work on at, walls, at all. Um, and that we will to evolve um, in various ways, both in embodied ways and in intelligence ways as a result of this. Um, and then actually in terms of AI or whatever, it's much more interesting to think about embedding it into intelligent environments, remote, some that don't require humans at all. I'm always uh, very confused about why we talk about, we're so worried about going to Mars, uh, but Earth is like definitely the best habitat for us. And, but it's, like there's lots of machines and robots that are like totally great out there and they're exploring and they're doing all these other things. So like this is sort of thinking about these habitats for us, but also that there's lots of, um, we live in pretty stupid environments. Like lights are, and buttons are stupid. You know, like the fact that like th there's not sensors that are automatically automated to help us control energy and electricity. Like this is just, this is a form of, of where it's not yet an intelligent system. And that like, I don't think that this would so much be a pro, like there's many people that might argue, everyone needs to be really conscious and just learn to turn their lights off. I think we're capable of higher order things. That like, we should be thinking about other things rather than being conscious of our environment, of everything that's happening all the time, because I think there's more, there bi there's bigger problems at stake. Um, and that this, cascades and scales into infrastructure. Um, this was one of the, I mean, it was horrible when it happened for a lot of people because of the supply chains, but one of the most entertaining Twitter weeks of my life on the Suez, the this, this ship stuck in the Suez Canal. But it's just to be, just to be said that like the, um, the, making environments more intelligent, more responsive, more capable of navigating things according to map is something we probably want to do and also that we, kind of need to do to sustain things. Okay, how am I doing? Not too bad. All right, maintenance. I, this is the last section, so we won't suffer too much longer. Um, so this was some new thinking that I was really thrilled to be provoked around because um, I ran a collective for 10 years and getting people to do their dishes or pick up their dishes is like, sort of makes you wanna give up. And so that, like just that reality of kind of real collective cohabitation and realizing how dif difficult it is to program people also provokes some of this thinking and thinking like, okay. So, but maintenance, I think, I'll talk a little bit about things that come to mind, but I, I made this list of things that it, it involves and might include from inspecting to sensing, tending, cleaning, diagnosing, monitoring, managing, routing, insuring, accounting, analysis, and so on and so on. There's many forms. I looked it up. I was really excited to find this list um, about all of these different forms. I haven't been to the other lecture, so maybe this is like not news to you and, and, so, and others have covered this in this series. But I got really excited about these different ways of, again, thinking about how you program maintenance, that maintenance isn't just something that you become conscious of all the time, but that it actually, just like an automated thing, gets programmed into time schedules, into environments itself, um, and these different forms of, and ways that you'd start to address it. Okay, so, when I think about maintenance, I think about brushing my teeth and going to the dentist. Just, just to start with, from a human perspective for a second, because I think it puts some other things into, into this. And I, I think about this in terms of like, maybe this is a decent starting place to just put into perspective some of the, the other questions we're asking around planetarity, not only because teeth are the things that survive us the longest at least. Um, so 
lots of cool images about you know early automated toothbrushes and whatever and your dentist helps you do this and there's lots of people training to learn how to do this better and if you're lucky then you get an automated toothbrush which actually tells you how long you need to brush your teeth and so you don't have to think about how long it is to do because if you're good then you follow the instructions of the toothbrush and it actually like kind of I mean if you have a really fancy one it has like a whole map of your mouth and like that, you know, it really tells you exactly how long you need to be and everything like that. And it, like they're musical, blah, blah. Um, and, and, you know, another form of maintenance I started thinking about is museumifying things, of protecting them from the rest of the world. That's another way to maintain them is to take them out of circulation. Now, I'm not a very big fan of that, um, but it is, it is a form of this. Um, I think maybe when we think about maintenance, we think about bridges and roads and the fact that it's kind of falling apart. There's political reasons um, why our infrastructure does or does not get, get maintained. Um, and, and that's about that, as I'm sure others in the series have said, it's not, it's not attractive. Maintenance isn't a fun thing. Maintenance is something that's embedded and the good thing about maintenance just like automation is when you're doing it well you don't really notice and you only notice like most systems reveal themselves when they break that's the one of the best ways to kind of find out how a system works is like you see it fall apart and and those aspects reveal itself now some of you might be thinking about okay like maintenance of the jungle and talking about how you know, various indigenous, indigenous communities have been maintaining ecosystems, but let's not also kind of separate these things that actually maintenance and the cohabitation of maintenance, whether it's humans in the biosphere or humans that are cleaning data or scrubbing data in the technosphere is not so different, that these are tending and maintenance operations. Um, another form of automated maintenance or kind of human cultivated automation, uh, automated maintenance, instigated maintenance, fires to maintain a forest ecosystem. There's destruction involved in maintenance. Um, and this was an interesting provocation that came up for me, but like, should we be thinking about also the worlds of AI or machines really as a jungle, which I think is where some of the doomerism comes in and the terror that, you know, the jungle is out there, or should we be thinking about as a garden that we maintain and manage and coexist with and that sometimes escapes or evolves us? I'm not sure. There might, there's advantages to both paradigms here. And then, of course, seed vaults, which might be, unfortunately, where we're headed, uh, which is that more protective maintenance is just to kind of survival mode on some level. Now, one thing that I love, and, and this goes back to the dishes story, is this kind of cleaning as maintenance. Um, and maintenance really about kind of getting rid of the dust and debris and everything. And there's a whole legacy, as you probably remember, Rosie, or those of you old enough to know about the Jetsons. Um, and you know, the idea was like you had a, a housekeeper who did all this work for you. And um, this was incredibly problematic because Rosie was a, a woman human. Um, she wasn't like a computer, but something I cannot find any information about that I don't understand is why robots aren't self-cleaning. Like, I cannot find examples of robots that clean themselves. And it's actually really hard. You can make robots that clean other robots much easier than you can make robots that clean yourselves. And the oven is kind of like the best example. But like, it, you know these KUKA robots that I showed, that those are the robots with the arm that like have the, that work on the cars. And they have these incredible 360 arms that they can move in all these different directions. And we had one in, at UC San Diego where I did my PhD, like, at, I don't know, there had been a huge grant and they bought one in the department. And then all, and I was like, so who cleans it? And they were like, yeah, inside the robot, there's like, they, it grows like the goopiest, like mushroomy, and it's like this whole rotating arm, but the arm can't get inside of itself to clean itself. And this is a huge philosophical orientation problem. Like, let's start by having robots clean themselves, and then we'll all be in a much better place. In the same way that, like, we try to bring our best selves. I, go, I try to go to yoga. I try to hydrate. Like, if I take care of myself, I enter the world much better for all of you. 
And so if, if we can do that as an orientation with the robots, we might be like starting in a better place here. Now, the other thing I think about in maintenance um, is the airline industry, because it's just fantastic how often it doesn't break down. That, I mean, we hear about sensational flights all the time, but the number of flights that travel a day that no disaster, how it's, it's wonderful. And what an industry to look at, to model how we might think about op actually an operations maintenance program because of the levels of precision in the system. I just wanted, this is COP28, everybody. Uh, these are the private jets landing on COP28. I just wanted to throw that, this was yesterday, so I just wanted to, just wanted to throw that in. Anyway, so I started just like pulling a few schedules. These might be inspiring to us later on because I didn't have enough time to develop the full program, but we might draw from the airline industry as some kind of maintenance operations that are interesting of kind of log books and the statistical analysis and the prediction and all of the kinds of overlapping coordinating effects that go into this uh, that might shape a program. Um, Boltensky, this was a, f a flight in Bologna that crashed that they, they rebuilt. So this is, again, another form of maintenance is not maintaining the original thing, but maintaining our memory of the thing. Um, and, and I think that's also important for narrative environments. Now, we were successful once. <laughs> or I mean, there more than once, but there was a moment, like when I was in school, uh, the big issue was that there was a hole in the ozone and everybody would be freaking out about it and kids would be like on the bus being like, there's a hole in the ozone. It's terrifying. And we fixed it. The Montreal Protocol in 1987, it wasn't like a giant democratic vote. It was a coordinated apparatus of regulation around getting rid of hydrocarbon fluorides, the kind of like things that refrigerators and hairspray and stuff, and they just banned it. They were just like, we're, get it, we're phasing this out. It's not allowed anymore. And you know what? The ozone started healing. Awesome. So this was like a really rare and great example of something that happened. So what was great about this provocation was thinking like, okay, what if actually one of the ways we oriented our thinking around AI was as a kind of earth maintenance program. And what would it involve? It would involve diagnostics, of course. We're kind of already doing that. It would involve prediction, which is what we're doing through models and the kind of new weather models that are open. It would involve modification, and that's not just, not just using AI, but uh, allowing AI to act on behalf of things that, that program, that either we program, but also that we might have set in motion that we no longer have control over, this is okay. Duplication, syntheticization, and distribution. So yeah, how, how might an AI-enabled Earth maintenance program function? And just to come back to this moment in history is that you know the cybernetic, cyberneticians were very interested in this. They were thinking about how it would be that a kind of uh, organization of feedback would start to allow decision to happen. Um, and it's really goofy because, again, you search the internet for kind of spatial computing earth management and it always, you can't find any images where humans aren't in it. So there's always like, it's like a command center and the, and the person's always in, in the center like with a big hallucination of earth. Um, it might be just much more banal. It might be just like this. like distributed robots at different places, coordination, but not one center of control. That also might be the imagination that we need to have of this. Um, other forms of maintenance thinking, James Lovelock and had a theory of Gaia is that the earth was like this self-regulating organism and that it was managing and maintaining itself. And we've pushed it out of whack. And so it's our role now to figure out how do we navigate the fact that um, maybe there's lots of contestations of this theory. It might never have been in whack in the way James Lovelock imagined the Nova scene to be. But however, the kind of regulation is no longer just embedded in that system. I mean, um, my father, who's a Republican, likes to say the earth has been heating up and cooling down for its whole life. And I'm like, yeah, but not, at the, not like this, dad. So th this is the kind of like, this is the philosophy that we have to deal with is that like it's not, it is not automatic in the same way. Um, 
I'm going backwards, I wanna go forwards. Now, part of this might be reproduction, right? And, and how machines, as we saw with John Van Neumann, reproduce themselves, and that's not only in the kind of technological or machine space that we saw, but also in the biological one, that there's, this is also intervening. What if AI looks like plants? Um, what if AI looks like cells? What if AI, look, all of these things, and they're, they're combinations of things. What if AI looks like robots cleaning the ocean at the bottom of the ocean that are producing other robots that are producing other robots that are cleaning the ocean at the bottom of the ocean? We don't belong there anyway, we don't go in there. So this is all this kind of stuff. I mean, we can go there with our spacesuits. So again, the ocean might be the closest place to outer space we are. Uh, taking carbon out of the atmosphere, this is an important form of maintenance. We can't do one or the other, right? We can't like cut back on carbon. We actually have to do it all. We have to cut back. We have to suck it out. You, we, I don't know if you've seen people making it into diamonds. This is very exciting. Uh, so, I mean, diamonds are already carbon, but there's synthetic diamonds now that are made of carbon from the atmosphere. This is a wonderful artificialization. Um, and, but also that this is also an image from um, a studio that we ran uh, with Antikythera last summer, but thinking about also why our financial systems are based on something or reference something like gold rather than something like carbon. So that the idea of maintenance and automation would be also embedded into the economy. I wouldn't need to make a conscious decision. That would be baked into the kind of price or the kind of system so that it would, you know, the fact that you can get an easy jet for 35 quid is insane based on where we're at on the planetary scale. So that, that is sort of the calibration. It's not like be a better person. It's like make it automated so that you actually don't need to decide. And finally, when we get to satellites, um, this is happening. Uh, there are satellites that are going out and recreate, and they're starting to program the maintenance of satellites into satellites. There's lots of space junk that we've produced floating in space, and now they're creating robots to maintain the space junk that we've put out into space and to put it also back together in, in interesting ways. So there's also a way that maintenance is also dealing with waste and putting it back together in interesting combinations. This is also not new, uh, has been envisioned since the beginning of outer space. Finally, I'm sorry I've kept you for so long with all these things. So I got excited about this acronym. Um, what if the program for planetary maintenance would be an automated artificial intelligence mission? What if we were on a maintenance mission? Humans would certainly be in the loop, but we would also maybe be in the lacuna. We would be on the side of it. We might not be the center of it. Um, and we kind of are, we feel like we're coasting to 0.6 reactive maintenance, but we don't, we're not experiencing it yet. So that's also creating this kind of out of sync situation where we know we're here, but we can't, we're not yet experiencing it. And so there's a question about accelerating towards that or making that come closer so that we can deal with it. Although we have to deal with all of these. We can't just, we can't just address five. Now, maintenance mode in software development is kind of exciting because that's when you've kind of, you've, you're done, you're done bugging. You're just in maintenance mode. It's like if something comes up. Um, but we're really in emergency mode and we need to, we need to address it. And I, I, there's something to be said here that the idea of luxury um, for all and what's luxurious about the earth, the flora and fauna, the fact that I can talk to anyone anywhere on the planet, and that is so, so luxurious. The fact that I can listen to a song and know what song it is, wow. But also that that, that shouldn't be thought about and like as if we're all gonna just sit in restaurants because there's so much work to do. Um, and so what is this gonna involve? It's gonna involve simulation, which is gonna involve prediction and automation. Um, it's probably gonna involve a tremendous amount of work uh, if you're interested, Fred Jameson wrote this fabulous book called The Uni Dual Power and the Universal Army, which is imagining kind of a, a working core, but uh, that he, he kind of talks about how 
the American military is the only socialist program left in America, but we might need like a program like this to a deal with the planetary maintenance questions we have. So rather imagining that like the robots will take all of our jobs, we probably need to enlist them and then keep working on the problem because we kind of have to rebuild everything or at least it would be nice to. Um, it might look like much more accelerated ideas that we can't realize yet, like the Dyson Sphere, or it might look like um, kind of temporary blackouts Things that we, we take a pause, not obviously so that we don't have to suffer from them, that we do them intentionally, that we kind of turn things, we're not going to turn things off totally. However, there might be moments at which certain kinds of pauses or certain kinds of orchestrations, universal orchestrations are necessary to um, do the things that we need to do. Thanks so much. This is the part where we say how wonderful. Yeah. We, we go back to the beginning, no? Because it's a nicer slide. Thank you, amazing. I have this role of introducing the questions, but I'm sure that the audience will have plenty of questions. I have a easy question and a very complicated question. Okay. Which one do you want to start with? Easy? Easy, <laughs> okay. So the easy one is about Stephanie's dreams. Oh. And it's about which in, in terms, I mean, somehow you, you describe this, but you want to, talk about something very immediate that may touch all of us, perhaps in the university or, or the realms that we interact with. What is your kind of wish? What is, it, what is that you wish that this will emerge, if you want to summarize that? Something that will be very, very close by. In That's terms such of a great and exciting and beautiful question. Like in terms of the what AI may bring to us, obviously. Yeah, I guess. Well, for all of us at CSM, I'd love to just start not talking about utopias or dystopias and start activating towards this mission. I, like this, I've never thought about this mission before. I'm gonna think about it, but like actually framing a mission like this and saying there's so many components to it. There's so many different things we need to do, but actually to think about what are the pieces? How would we organize it? What points of intervention would we need to figure out? What kind of philosophical questions we need to ask to get there around, around governance, around organizing things, around what work, what kind of work we might need to do. And some of you are already doing it, but to think about it under a framework where we felt like we were collaborating on a bigger project that feels like the project would be a very nice place to start, at least for me, I think. And I think for the folks in, Many of the folks in narrative environments, they were kind of uh, feeling like a bit of a collective that's working on this set of problems already, but we'd love to fold more people into, into this set of questions. Thank you. Then the slightly more convoluted question. I mean, your lecture is, is very inspirational, and I think that there is something uh, there I was taking notes, and one of the notes I took is that it's starting with a reference to Android's dream of electric ships, and perhaps you know where I'm going now. So the, it, Jonathan Crary, he did in this kind of, in his studies about the techniques of the observer, he was analyzing how the technological advancements of the 19th century shift the way we see and since shift the way we think and we perceive reality. There's a lot of, the focus now in AI as a tool and how we tool it off and we improve but by using it as a tool. But one question if we pick up what Jonathan Corey was trying to understand in terms of the 19th century and perhaps if we project ourselves 100, uh, 100 years uh, 
in the future is about whether you may foresee or you have any kind of theoretical background that you may share with us in terms of how AI may be shifting our way of uh, thinking, understanding things, how this may shift the, only the kind of anthropos uh, anthropocentric way of perceiving reality to something else. Um, perhaps it's even updating the notions of actor network theories, et cetera, what is the center and how we may learn from this. So is there anything that we may learn from AI systems, et cetera, that may shift the way we perceive, act, and understand reality? Yes, all the time. Oh, so maybe I put this in terms of some science fiction or speculative fiction. I don't know how many of you have seen Idiocracy, but it does worry me a lot. I mean, it's like it's it's a movie by the guy who made Beavis and Butthead, and it's about like humans kind of sitting in their own trash in automated environments and and this kind of thing. Um, and I think there's a way that there. There's definitely an evolution, but I think part of the evolution is that because a lot of these systems are still thinking and focused on replacement, like we're building replacement apparatuses, although we, for those of us here who have to use the Microsoft ecosystem, <laughs> you spend most of your day going, this has got, like there's gotta be better ways that we can coordinate amongst ourselves, communicate, figure out how to operate. And, and so, you know, I, I spend a fair bit of time wondering how AI can't, like my phone doesn't know how to switch from Bluetooth or, or from cellular to Wi-Fi automatically. So first it's kind of, let's first address, use AI to address a lot of embedded problems. I had a great conversation with a woman from the Turing Institute yesterday was, who was talking about gender and AI. And I was saying, well, how do we think about this? Especially, you know, it's typically white men who are developing these systems and what would it mean to develop these systems? And we were talking about this lineage of women as computers and women playing some of the, mo typically playing the role of logistics and coordination. And that might be one of the first things that the AI does. Um, how this takes us to the other question is, I think it's true that we, we are evolving with the tools. And that means that we, we want to and have to shift and we need philosophy more than ever because it forces us to ask if actually some of the values and things that, and things that we thought were ethical actually are not ethical anymore. The, re the way that we've been doing science fiction with a human at the center is actually not the way that we should be doing science fiction in the future. So that like updating our own models is super important. So if we just kind of fall into this um, way that we're using the old models that we have of who we are in relation to, to but I, I, I think the other thing is to say it's not, it's probably not just a tool of ours and that we need to also get comfortable with that like that that there are other forms of intelligence just like there always have been and there are that we don't control and that like the idea of us controlling them is also a recent idea and has led to a lot of the problems that we're now we're now how to have to evolve ourselves out of that's not to say it doesn't that we don't do our best to design it and we don't do our best to be part of that design, but thinking about design is setting things in motion rather than controlling the entire process, creating a, a platform for something to evolve that we might not know the consequences of. But, yeah? Are you happy? You can be unhappy with my answer. No, 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 I think uh, it's okay. It's okay. okay. <laughs> Anybody else out there can be unhappy too. So let's open to the public then, to the audience. Hi, thank you, Stephanie. That was a great talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, I was just wondering, so with regard to AI and possibly using it, I know you said not as a tool, but I'm going to use that word, sorry, <laughs> as a tool, or possibly, let's say, commissioning AI to address some of our pressing issues, so like predicting certain migration patterns or looming famine or 
natural disasters? What do you see? Um, okay, is there a way to commission AI in a way that that information couldn't somehow be weaponized, but rather it, it would somehow not have a consciousness, but instead just do the work without our intervention? Is that, does that make any sense? Of course, um, and thank you for multitasking during this talk. We had a knitter up here for a while, it was so relaxing. Um, I think there's a few things to say about this. Uh, there, there are ways, it's never going to be perfect. Like, m I, there's this great book called When We Cease to Understand the World um, by Benjamin Labutet, Labutet, anybody? Um, but he reminds us of, I'm gonna blank on the name of the scientist who developed the, um, who identified, who separated, made ammonia, and that ammonia and nitrogen both was the kind of gas that was used in World War I and subsequently in World War II, but it also led to the production of agriculture that f fed the whole planet. Like both, so he won, he both was like one of the biggest world destroyers and also one of the world saviors. And this is kind of the conundrum we're in a little bit. And I think one of the starting points of technology is we want to create all sorts of safeguards to the fullest extent possible. We also need to kind of contend with the fact that they're never going to be purely, purely safe and that these maybe we can use scenarios to map out what these things might be and might look like, but we probably also have to know that we're taking a risk. I don't, I'm not an AI technologist, so I can't answer for you exactly how to make the model safer, um, but I do know that I think one of the things is that there's a lot of conversations around how to govern AI in it and not how to use AI as a tool for governance. So we're applying the old models of governance to AI rather than, or yet we're applying old models rather than think about how could this intelligence actually be things that we program into governance, governance so that it, something like representative representation doesn't work at all in the same way that we imagine it to. And then if, if those, effects were happening, then we might think about, okay, there is always a reason that um, behind, there, there is always exceptions to s humans that are working well to safeguard the world. There's always systems that malfunction. But how can we be more like, how can the system of the world be more like the airline industry? There are crashes, but mo <laughs> way more often than not, things operate. Stephanie, I think I have a question that builds on that maybe a bit. First, I wanted to say, though, that actually soap itself is really hard to clean up. Yeah. So it might just be another piece of that. <laughs> um, I, I was wondering, it, it, like I said, it builds on your last answer. When you say that humans are capable of higher order things, what kinds of things do you think humans are capable of? Hmm. I mean... Ah, like higher order? As in lower level, like in, in engineering, or something else, like higher order as in like, as in like layers of She's the asking cosmos. whether I'm actually a misanthrope. Um, <laughs> I think in the same way we got ourselves into this mess, we are the ones that are gonna have to engineer our way out of it. And that in and of itself would be a huge feat to override our own, like we have, we find ways to override ourselves all the time. And so actually to like reprogram ourselves might be part of the reprogramming of the planet. And that we are capable of doing that or creating systems that override our worst impulses or our programming also. And so that like crafting that evolution is actually what like, we have built all of this. This, you know, like, it's not like brute wrote nature was, you know, it, it's beautiful, it's complex, but like, look what we've done. We did amazing things. 
and we're capable of doing exponential amazing things as well, but not if we hold ourselves back to like just, you know, taking selfies. I am a, a fine arts student, but um, I find myself very interested in how um, I can sort of contribute to making the world more sustainable, even as a fine artist, which might seem removed from this. Uh, but so I was wondering, what are your views on, um, is it possible to like create a completely sustainable building or a city? And also, um, how do you think um, artists could fit into this, do you see AI as like a way to achieve the sustainability goals? Um, Thank you so much for coming. We really need finance people on the mission, for sure. I mean, a huge part is reprogramming the economics around this. Fine art, fine art. Fine art. <laughs> I was like, okay, it's the finance department over here. Thank you, finance department. We do have the finance department in the house. Thank you so much. Yes, we really need your work and reprogram the mission. We, we need everyone. This is, this is the point. Um, so art, I think, in its best mode, works very similarly to philosophy, is it's able to step back and ask kind of the deepest questions about how things w work. So there's, there's a non-instrumental necessity to art um, in, in unearthing kind of the dynamics around this. I think it does need to make sure that it communicates, that it's not about self-expression, but that it's about expressing the complex dynamics of the world around us and not centering the artist, capital A, but it's actually about the, the art of the evolution of the things in the world. We're also gonna need a lot of propaganda, like a lot. So uh, to the extent that um, that art might take distributed forms for kind of planetary media, that anything from uh, memes to, to recognizable things that start to circulate that, that help advocate for the mission, we'll, we'll need you on this as well. So it, across the spectrum, yes. My question is a little different. I would like to know your personal view on this. What is human? <laughs> huh. I don't, uh, like what makes us human or where the boundaries are between human and other things? Like, are we machines? Mm, not. In a way, but also like there's a there's a way in which our models of what we make are also the ways that we think about ourselves. So like you know, when we, we used to think about ourselves as like machines when kind of machines were the things that we were making and, and like, so this is part of the artificial, artificial intelligence conundrum is that we're also imitating the things that we're making and using those abstract models of the things to, to make ourselves or how we think about ourselves. So I think that we're incredibly stubborn and incredibly malleable. That's one of the things that is incredibly interesting to me about humans is that we can turn on it like in an emergency the ways that we're able to navigate and and move are but yet it's so hard to get our thinking to shift so this capacity this like ultimate creativity in these situations but then also our inability to evolve this for me is like a very special human characteristic um, one, one part of us, at least. Next question. Hi, uh, thank you. 
Uh, my question was, how does this deal with like the built-in opalescence that we have, like in terms of maintenance and planet and even AI? Yeah, th this is a great question around like planned op obsolescence. Like we program, like my computer's programmed to break or something like this. Yeah, that's what you're asking? Yeah, uh, really good and useful question. Um, it's sort of like elections were organized this way too, right? It's sort of like, okay, you have four, you know, you can go round and round. Is like two elections good? Is in, in, you know, if you have a long runway, then you can do a lot of really great or really terrible things, and you don't have to like spend your whole time getting into that situation. So I, but, but planning in breakage, planning in disappearance, in in this way that you're suggesting, I think could actually be a really useful tool in some cases. But then then is there kind of a, a repair operation or does everything go run through a kind of reboot mode? Um, I don't, you open up an amazing provocation. Let's take that right back into the briefs. Um, thanks, Paige. Wonderful. Thanks, Stephanie. Hi. Uh, so many drawings that I just want to take. So if I could have the slides after, that would be amazing. Um, I've been invited to talk with 100 finance staff at UAL. I've got an hour to talk about carbon, so maybe I can also oh, talk yeah. to you about that. Let's that would be great. Um, my, my like, there's lots of things I could, I could pause on. The one thing that uh, struck me was your, like, uh, your problem with the switch. Um, this on-off mechanism. I love switches. I love an on-off. I come into the building every day, and as I walk into the office as the first person in, the lights come on, and one after another, they stay on. More lights than I need. I would love to be able to switch off the lights in the building, but they remain on, and I lose the power to be able to turn off those lights because of that automated perhaps not intelligent system, so I see something like some great power in, in the on-off and a bit of like authority and control to be able to mm. turn off these systems. So I just want to pursue a little bit with that. No, why, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, this <laughs> why is, the switch is This bad. is such a wonderful thing, and don't get me wrong, I love pushing the elevator button as much as the next guy, you know? like So there is a, a pleasure in switches, but this is a much more important point, I think, about like, also, automated systems can be really dumb too. Don't get it, like it's not just like one, sis one physical system is smart, it's that like if it's ubiquitous, if it doesn't have nuance, if there's not ways of intervening. I, like, I was on a train a few months ago and it had the wrong setting on, so it was telling us that the locations were the locations that were coming and I, kn I knew because I live there that it's not it wasn't the right thing, and it was like terrible, like totally terrible. But these are trade-offs, you know? But I think that like we can make more intelligent automated systems with more finer grain or more responsiveness or more ways, modes of interactivity. So, you know, this is all certainly possible, and I think it behooves us just as much. I think in the way, in the thing that you're opening, in the way Paige is thinking about is like, in, what are the modalities through which we would actually think about the programming within side those systems so that it's not either or. It's not like switch or no switch. It's like actually what are the modes of nuance in which either that control, like control in the cases we should have control, like I need the lights on, versus control in the, in the situations that maybe we shouldn't or are beyond our kind of the local, you know, we, there's all these scales at which this mission has to operate. And there's definitely dynamics in which is quite relevant to the local that has nothing to do with the planetary and vice versa. That sometimes the planet, what happens on the planetary scale has nothing to do with how we should actually think about the nuance of the local scale. But we have to work this out. Oscar, um, I am a little bit mindful of time. I have a question, but 
I want to, uh, to know if there's any of our students who have any other questions they would like to ask before I ask mine. No, but you're a PhD student, I mean BA. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I want one second, yeah, one second. I, I, I just want to go kind of like BA, master's, PhD, if that, so just to prioritize our uh, students, this series is dedicated to. Uh, any questions around over there? You had your go. I want to ask one more thing. Yeah, 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 one second. <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah, one second. Where was the question? Oh, there. <laughs> Hi. Sorry, I have to. I have to do the annoying thing of ask a question when everybody wants to go. Um, my question is potentially obvious and potentially you've already answered, but I want to pick on the semantics because you've talked about sort of thinking of artificial intelligence as th synthetic intelligence instead. So just in terms of actually the semantics of things, if we think about artificial as some sort of a inauthentic replacement, which you don't agree with in terms of thinking about AI as a replacement, um, but then thinking about synthetic can also mean some artificial in a sense of made artificially, but also uh, semantically it is related to synthesis. So if we're talking about sort of systems thinking, and planetary scales, and then thinking about synthesis as a sort of process of combining. Um, are we talking about that as, um, as combining sort of simpler forms of intelligence to build a more complex one? Or sort of, if, not, if AI is not a replacement and some sort of synthesis, and what, like, what is the synthesis part of it, if there is one? I think it's happening, thank you, Charlie. Also straight into the brief, but um, I, I think in this, in the like the synthesis is happening all the time, and then it's desynthesized. Then other things open as a result of see, of that synthesis. This is a process of evolution. This is the process of automation. It's more the the artificial beef. I think has more to do with like the connotative way it traps us. It, it's it's synthesis or sorry, synthetic also has this idea of artificial or imitation, but not to the level that we assume. And so this is the kind of narrative bit where it gets in the way of the model we have about something. But I think that there is constantly a process, and I mean, I think we know this as we make things, where things congeal and synthesize as a matter of space, time, materials, the special years, like 1927, whoa. You know, like last year, may, like 2020 pandemic, whoa. Lots of things all of a sudden congealed and like, and, and history works like this too. There's this idea of like conduit of waves where like every, there's kind of these 40 years, this is for the finance people. There's like 40 years cycles of economic transformation where like there's synthesis and then it comes apart. And so I think it's always happening. It's just the scales that it's happening at appear different to us. They might appear different. We might, you know, to a to a satellite or a microscope, those time scales of synthesis might feel appear very different than to us. And what's interesting is that we can start looking across those to find counterintuitive ways of encountering the synthesis that that's happening and the, and the disillusion th that's happening around us. But to be continued, because I, I, kn I know I haven't ever answered your question to the fullest extent I can. I, are we okay with five more minutes? Mm -hmm. Yeah? Okay, great. Um, questions, MA level? Oh, Steph, you're back here. We are having <laughs> five more minutes. I would love to close with you present here. Uh, sorry, uh, there was a question over there, and then, and then I would love to have question yeah. Thank you, and I'll come back to the light switches, and uh, and I think that the high higher power that you were talking about, and I think when you're reflecting on your living and trying to convince people to wash their dishes, and then that kind of thing that we are 
gonna live in a, we should be more preoccupied with power by. And I think it's almost the inverse. If you can't turn off the light switches, how on earth do you think you're gonna be able to command like the larger scale higher power? Or, or like if you can't wash your dishes, how, how can we rethink Rethink global thinking, and I think also coming from the, the kind of uh, environment movement and, and working with people that can't wash their dishes. And it's like, and then you see things start collapsing in the, in the level of organization very quickly, where you have powerful ideas and powerful thinking and really brilliant uh, kind of technology. And I almost feel like it's the opposite, like AI can do the, the high scale power thinking that we want to do because we want to abandon the light switching, we want to abandon the things we don't want to do. But I almost feel is the because AI can can get to that level because it can work very simply with the AI can learn. We we don't want to exercise what we learn. We learn but we don't want to do it. Well AI very quickly will turn off the light switches and move on to thinking of how to organize this higher level. So I think there's also this dichotomy that I feel like that you know, to be human is to be able to learn and to do, and it's almost training yourself to always do the simple mundane actions of light switches and of washing the dishes. On the, and from that, you actually train to be able to think in that higher, higher, yeah, maybe I'm, I'm coming from the opposite view, but with very similar outcomes. But I feel like sometimes when we jump from the, what do I need to do individually in the very small scales daily, it becomes overwhelming, but when you become part of your exercise, it's almost when you become the computer, right? You're not even thinking anymore. You know, it's, it's part of what you do. And it's, it's in the training of the small bits that enable you to go in on to think of larger systems. So I, yeah, I just wanted your reflection on that. Um, this is, it's good and it's a really nuanced question, or especially around like, the question of when the when the conscious and when the unconscious is useful and what we lose by automating different steps. I mean, this is like, there's a lot of discussion around when, you know, we all of a sudden got dishwashers and all these like automated appliances in the kitchen. Actually, it, it didn't free up women at the same way that they thought. And actually there was just like more to do in terms of like various, various things. That is and isn't true on some level. And I think like, it's the same here. I, I think that like, it's not like becoming more conscious at every minute means that we're going to solve the problem. I think that as you're speaking to, it's more interesting is like the embedded programming of our, of what we're up to. However, I do think there is a way in which we are enabled by infrastructure that is built in, like we don't have to go get the water from the river right now, like here at least, and that means that we have time to do all sorts of other interesting and creative things. And like, yes, that walk to the river probably produced all sorts of insights that now we don't have anymore. Where our bodies change as a result. So this is, comes back to your question also about what it's human is like, there are trade-offs in these things. We are. Like we have lost our navigational senses and abilities that we once had, but in return, I have a map of a huge city on, like I've outsourced that kind of information into um, a machine. And it means that if I am dependent on that machine, if I'm without it, then, and, but that kind of dependency is also probably a good trade off. Or it's just part, like maybe good is not the right word, but it's a trade-off. And it seems like because we're already coordinated and there's more coordination to do to get out of the mess we're in, that more of those trade-offs is probably what it's going to take. And so I think just that there's a lot of nuance in what you're describing about what George is bringing up and what you're describing about where those trade-offs happen when it's useful. But I think it's not to say that we just need to hold fast to the things that we've already been doing because that preserves something special about about us. We, in every case, no. And, and there's many cases in which like, you know, I gave, I gave up, I tried everything. I published like newspapers in the pretend press office about why people didn't clean their dishes. We like thought about installing a surveillance camera around and then like the collective got very upset, but like, you're just leaving your dishes on the table. Then we got a dishwasher, that was awesome. 
in this case, like, and it was like high power, you know, so, but, you know, you s so yeah. And then maybe like there was more time when, there, but it's just different levels of things. But I think being sensitive, as you're saying, to the different levels and the ways that that happens is absolutely imperative. Yeah, I, I just wanted to follow up on that because I think some qualification is needed as to who are we that don't need to go and collect water, for example, um, and, and uh, who, who is us. And my question was um, going back to the notion of luxury uh, and there's many things, and thank you, Steph, for your, for your presentation, because, uh, for your lecture. Th there's many things that I could pick up. We don't have time. But there's one about the kind of idea of introducing an, a new currency system that is not based on money, but on CO2. And um, that will be ideal uh, in the mission. For for maintaining the planet, you are A M A A I M, right? Um, but it is restricted. There's a question of how we get out of this mess. But some of us not not having luxury anymore, and some others having a piece of that luxury. And so, if we are going to get out of this mess, this question of equity would be aided or not by AI? What do you think? It certainly can be. It, it's not guaranteed. No, I, like, I, it, sure. Because I mean, what I, 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 let me just call, what I, what I, there's a lot of optimism, and this is what I love about your presentation, but it is always, there's a tint of fiction, because for me, there's a hold on a really crude reality that I don't know how AI will help us to sort out. Don't you think we should work this out as part of the mission? Yes. The well, the mission feels a bit fictional. <laughs> but, but that's why I showed the thing about the Uber and that the fiction actually creates the reality as much as the, like it is, any design process is in some ways like starting with some sort of fiction of what is possible. And then also then looking at the reality around and then pulling out from that reality things that are fictions already. Like we're living in, I'm not saying that like reality is a fiction, but it also feels like that a lot. Oh, like right, this whole yeah. thing is like Cold Drops Yard is a complete hallucination. So, yeah, but that's not reality. <laughs> no, I know, but, a lot of people. but, not for a lot of people, but for many, for some here now, but also the reality for a lot of people is actually like just as imperative and interesting that they have these tools and these tools might influence and inform them in all ways. Like development isn't linear or direct or straight. It has leaps, it has jumps. We might wanna like, so it's just to say that nothing will evolve like, it's not just a tool for the rich or for this. It's like, it is a new way of thinking about intelligence that may or may not have implications for how resources can get distributed in the first place. And and please hold down that, that philosophy on the mission. <laughs> yeah, we are, we are going to need a lot of propaganda, the, as you said. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Should we just finish with that? Yeah, I want let's to keep it going. We have so yeah, I mean, yeah. we're together in this school, so we can keep this conversation. No? I never thought about maintenance as a planetary mission aided by AI. Mm -hmm. And now I have some sort of imagination, and it's always what you do. So thank you so much, Steph, for that. Thank you for the provocation. Um, and thank you, everyone, for coming. I have a lot of thank yous to give. So bear with me for a second, not only for Stephanie uh, being inspirational and uh, you know, building up these narratives of the future. I always set them in the future, which are very useful uh, as a driver of, of the present. Uh, thank you to Oscar um, for hosting today.
and for being um, <laughs> an inspirational uh, course leader that, that, that always um, aids these kind of initiatives to happen. Thank you, Alex, uh, for stepping in and supporting all this also. It wouldn't have been possible without Stephanie roaming over here sitting with me. So thanks so much, Steph. And let's keep it going, yeah. Uh, thank you to our students, which have been here uh, always, and uh, we we uh, we get motivated by having lectures tailored to your program. So that's that's great uh, to see. Um, and thank you for all the rest of the people in the audience. I want to also thank the uh, events team and John, which is out there. Uh, letting people in who booked through Eventbrite. Um, I want to, to also uh, thank uh, Paula and uh, Elise and Anna, uh, who are our ushers today, and they have to bear with us being late. And the tech team uh, who have uh, the recording of the sessions and all the tech here ready for us, uh, Juan, and they endure these lectures and they are not really, uh, you know, uh, keen on the subjects necessarily. <laughs> so thank you for them. There's a, a lot of people behind making this series possible. So um, ultimately also thank you for, for, for coming and spending the evening with us. Thank you, Adriana, for <laughs> organizing this amazing series of lectures.